Let's welcome in our co-host, the Admiral Bill Stubblefield, two-star. Good morning, Rob. Great to be here this morning. Great to have you with us, Bill, and great to have lunch with you yesterday, I, too. I enjoyed that very much. It's always a lot of fun. Yeah, uh, next time, peanut butter and jelly for me, Bill, not just the peanut butter. Who's I like paying? The, I like Who's the paying? jelly, If too. I'm paying, it's going to be peanut just butter peanut and jelly. Butter? Yeah. Just peanut butter? <laughs> if you're paying, though, it's going to be a lot more. <laughs> I'm feeling a little left out. So there was a lunch uh, excursion yes. that I wasn't invited Boys to. Boys club lunch. Uh, hmm. Yeah, this, this was uh, not... Uh, no females allowed. Yes, that's correct. This Be was careful as you walk down this path. This, Rob. Was, <laughs> this was like the Little Rascals. It was the He Man Women Haters Club. Bill was spanky. I was alfalfa. Okay, okay. I'll remember <laughs> yeah. this. I'll you, remember you this. You played alfalfa up to the key, key as well. You did a good job playing alfalfa. Well, thank you. I yep. appreciate that, yep. Bill. I'm I'm not a bad alfalfa. Now. <laughs> Uh, Maria Lawrence and the other voice you just heard. There, Maria. Good morning to you. Good morning. Happy to be here. Happy to have you back. Oh, not that you. not that my corn bee didn't yeah. do it was a fantabulous job marvelous. last week, but and, and we did miss you yesterday, <laughs> Maria. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> I wasn't angling. Well, yeah, I was for that compliment, but okay. I think the last couple times you were invited, you couldn't make it. Yeah, yeah. then they were usually Fridays. I think one time I did make it though. Yeah, if you um, if you miss two lunches, you get taken you're off, off the, the, off the, off the list. list. It's yeah. a tough crowd. And since Rob controls the list, you have to be nice to Rob. <laughs> I will. I will. <laughs> well, Rob keep asking, and and maybe yeah. I'll join. Our first guest is a repeat guest uh, on the program, and also as a member of the Stubblefield Institute's board of directors. Bill, a little shine on that for us. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, yes, uh, our guest is Peter Loge, who's uh, one of the, not only one of the smartest men I know, but one of the nicest people I know. Uh, really, a, a good guy, and he's also extremely knowledgeable when it comes to politics and the inner circle of how politics works inside D.C. So, with what we've had with uh, uh, President. Biden stepping down and Vice President uh, Kamala Harris running. I thought Peter would be a wonderful person to come in and get we get some insight inside the Beltway insight. And he's the director of the School of Media Relations and Public Affairs at George Washington University as well. Peter Loge, good morning. Thank you so much for joining us. Uh, good morning. I, I'm pleased to be here. Um, I'm interested in hearing from this guest that Bill says nice things about because I'm not sure that's me, but. He's we'll he's coming up at eight thirty five, but we're going to begin with you, Peter. So it's <laughs> <laughs> that works for me. I'm so, used, you know, so, I spent most of my life as a staffer. I'm used yeah, to being the guy who sets yeah. up the one who matters. Yeah. So talk fast, Peter. We don't want to run out. I uh, don't want to uh, interfere with the next guy coming down the line. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, uh, Peter, I said on uh, Monday when I got back from my vacation, I, I had taken off the previous Friday and then all of last week as well. And usually when I take off. Either somebody here gets fired or something big happens. Big happens in the world. And, and Bill and I are still here. You're so, still here, so there yeah, wasn't a so fire part. But the day I take off, uh, former President Trump, an assassination attempt at him uh, in, in Butler, uh, Pennsylvania, yeah, which is very just close to north us. of Pittsburgh, yeah. close to where we grew up. As a matter of fact, the best man in my wedding party was from uh, Butler. And then, of course, we have the decision on my, the day I return that uh, Joe Biden decides he's not going to run for re-election and we have now the further developments with Kamala Harris and now getting the endorsement of pretty much everybody who matters on the Democratic Party side as the attention shifts now to her the fundraising money has rolled in uh, we live in interesting times here Peter uh, yeah we do most of it I've just learned is you're, you're never allowed to go on vacation <laughs> 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 Um, I do want to. I want to say that the the attempted at assassination of Donald Trump was um, appalling, offensive, and I was really glad to see that political leaders on across the political spectrum came out condemning political violence. It's not normal. It's not okay. Politics is partisan, sharp elbows. But as as Bill knows, and he's committed um, a lot of his money and life to, it can still be fair, honest, and not violent. And it's just. Like I, I spent my lifetime in Democratic politics, and that that act of violence just curled my stomach. Not okay. Yeah, there's there's uh, obviously a history of that in this country, others as well, but certainly in this country of assassination and assassination attempts. And I was born in '63, and that's obviously the year of John F. Kennedy's assassination. I'm five when John F. when Robert F. Kennedy is uh, shot, Martin Luther King is uh, shot. And then you had the attempts on Gerald Ford's life, the shooting of Ronald Reagan. And uh, for younger Americans, this would have been their first introduction to something like that, Peter. 
At, at the presidential level, yes. But in recent years, we've seen more and more of it um, at lower levels, right? Congressman Steve Scalise was shot at, of all things, a baseball practice. Um, Represent, then Representative Gabby Giffords was shot while talking to her constituents in Arizona. You've had threats to staffers, to, to judges, to political appointees. Earlier this year, uh, I had the honor of hosting a conversation with the FDA commissioner, a guy named Dr. Robert Califf, with whom I worked um, in the Obama administration, a big conversation at GW, and he casually mentioned, casually mentioned, death threats are a daily part of the job. And he said it in a way that like traffic in Shepherdstown is bad on weekends because everybody from D.C. And that's that's just appalling. Mm -hmm. Well, it's interesting you say that, um, Peter. I had the experience several months ago. We invited um, Senator Shelley Moore Capito to um, our campus. I work as the development director at Hospice of the Panhandle. We were celebrating an anniversary, and the team at her office cautioned me highly not to put out any media alerts what have you until a day or so before because this is a reality primarily i think since gabby giffords um shooting but you know it didn't even occur to me um as a former person in um in the media to to think about that and i was just like what a world we're living i mean it's just, it's it, unbelievable is what it is. And it, it's gotten worse, right? So, I mean, I've been doing this for a long time. Um, I'm not distinguished so much as I am. I've hung around a lot. <laughs> and I worked, at a member, I worked for a member of the House in Arizona who voted for the Brady Bill back in the early 90s, some gun control. We got marched on by guys carrying guns. And I didn't feel unsafe. I thought, all right, they disagree with us. They're not our voters. Go for it. This is what they should be doing. Uh, I worked in the Senate, and I got a death threat. As a, I was a senior staffer for a senator, I worked in the House on the um, on the Affordable Care Act, Obamacare, and the guy I worked for very much liked civil protests. Like he liked the rough and tumble in politics. And when he went to vote, he said, "Come on, we're going to vote." I said, "Congressman, you know what you're doing. You don't need me to do this. You're, <laughs> we've been talking about this." He said, "No, no, we got to go." And so we we went out, and I said, "Let's go through the tunnels because there are tunnels connecting the offices to the Capitol." Right. I said, "No, we got to walk through the crowd. We got to hear the people." And we walked through a group of very angry people who really didn't like what we were going to do, and I never felt unsafe. But now it's different. Yeah. Now now it, it feels different, and, and I think it's incumbent on all of us, uh, politicians, pundits, the press, everybody, to dial it back and to call each other out, call out people in our own party, the opposite party, our friends, our opponents, and say, hey, you know, be partisan, make a strong case, but... You know, the moment we stop arguing and start throwing rocks at each other is the moment the democracy decays. So let's argue. Let's not throw punches. Peter, let's let's uh, let us move to the latter part of what happened last week, and that was when President <laughs> Biden stepped down and Vice President uh, Harris uh, has is assumed the, uh, uh, the, the role of the candidate. Uh, what do you see playing out here? And the other question is, what do you see to be the main issues in the upcoming presidential race? Uh, great question. I think the, the first thing to, to recall is the work of a scholar named Philip Tetlock, who counted, he looked at, at pundits' predictions on Sunday morning shows, people like, like me on Sunday morning shows, and look at what actually happened. And he found out that dart-throwing monkeys are better predictors of political outcomes than pundits. So grain of salt, everybody. Um, that said, I think that what we can expect to see is what we've seen anyway. Right. Um, Trump supporters are going to continue to support Trump. Biden supporters will probably shift over to Harris. Democrats will vote for Democrats. Republicans will vote for Republicans. I expect the Republican Party to do what they've been doing, which is say, you know, if you like Joe, if you hate Joe Biden, you're going to hate Vice President Harris. Vice President Harris was in charge of the U.S. southern border. Nobody likes what's going on on the U.S.-Mexico border. Uh, Vice President Harris ran for president against Joe Biden in 2020. And she said a lot of stuff that... A lot of Americans might not like, and the Republicans are doing what they should do, which is pointing that out. The other thing I do want to, I want to point out, though, to the Republicans' credit is some, some members, some Republicans in the House of Representatives went out, started by pointing out that um, Vice President Harris is a woman, she's African-American, she's of Indian descent, and a lot of Republicans, a lot of Republican leaders said, hey, stop that, that doesn't matter. What matters is her record, let's run against her record and what she says, not what she looks like. So I think I think we can see more of that, right? I mean, 
you know, the Republicans are going to run on inflation, immigration, and chaos, which is what they're going to run on a week ago, I think. How do you see Project 2025 playing in this upcoming race? Yeah, that's a that's a good question. Um, I assume because they're listening to you and and you follow this stuff, your 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 listeners know what Project Twenty Twenty Five is. It's not part of the Republican National Committee. It's not official. It's from the Heritage Foundation, which is a, a conservative think tank in town. You know, I know a lot of Republicans are trying to back away from it. They call it a pain in the blank. But um, that said, you know they might have some influence if Trump gets elected. And there are some pretty conservative policies, and I think Democrats are going to try to say. Um, this is the Republican playbook. This is what they want to do. Donald Trump is telling you what he wants to do on day one, and it's this list of things which you think, which we think voters in in Pennsylvania, uh, Michigan, Wisconsin, Arizona, some other swing states really, really don't like and don't represent American values. And I think a lot of Republicans are going to run on it. They're going to say, "Yeah, this is where we stand. This is where America should be." But um, it's I, if I were a Republican candidate, I would be saying, hey, these are just ideas. These aren't my ideas. If I were a Democrat, I'd be saying, hey, these are Republican ideas through and through. Uh, we'll, we'll see how that plays out. Now, there's been some uh, some observations recently that the uh, uh, that the MAGA movement is to the right of uh, Donald Trump and that the uh, uh, Project 2025 reflects the MAGA movement more so than it reflects Donald Trump. Any insight to that at all? Uh, that's certainly what what a lot of the people in the Republican National Committee are saying. It's hard to know, honestly, where Donald Trump stands ideologically. Uh, he donated three thousand dollars to to Kamala Harris when she was running for Attorney General of California. He's been a Democratic donor. He donated to Planned Parenthood. He's had several different positions on choice. Uh, I'm, it's, it's unclear to me where Donald Trump's ideological center is because he, he didn't come up in politics, right? He came up in real estate. He came up in business. Um, you know, I came up working for a set of ideas and ideals. And I've been lucky enough to make a living doing it. Uh, Donald Trump came up making a living and then shifted into politics. I think it's kind of unclear where he stands. Um, what a lot of candidates do, of course, in campaigns is you lean into where you think the voters are just enough to make them think you agree with them. And then when you get elected, you say, OK, here's what we're actually going to do. Um, so, we'll I don't know if, if Trump gets reelected, we'll see how closely he's aligned to that. And, of course, there's a the House and the Senate, right? Nothing's going to happen at that without the House and the Senate. Probably more people in the House are supportive of Project 2025 than in the Senate, but maybe not. Um, and that's where a lot of the a lot of the, the debates will take place. And the other factor that's interesting these days, the vice president that uh, uh, that uh, Harris may go with, and I'd be curious to see your sight, insight there. But the other with uh, uh, J.D. Vance being the vice president selectee for President Trump, was that looking at 2024 or is that looking downstream at 2028 and 2032? Uh, the answer is probably yes and. Um, <laughs> excuse me, I think that political scientists have found repeatedly that vice presidential candidates really don't do anything. Uh, Paul Ryan couldn't deliver Wisconsin, um, for example. Al Gore couldn't deliver Tennessee. Uh, and, and that's what it looked like this year up until, you know, Sunday afternoon at about 1.45. We'll, we'll see what happens. I think that uh, Senator Vance, I think, was an interesting choice for, for a couple of reasons. One is he... He has a lot of the rhetorical style and flourishes that President President Trump has. He's loud. He's aggressive. He's foot forward, uh, which which a lot of the his supporters like. He also he's young. Um, Gen X is being skipped over for for a minute there. We went from boomers to to, to Gen Z, and as a Gen Xer, I thought you know once again we're being thrown out in the cold. Uh, he also <laughs> has access to incredible sums of money. He was a very successful venture capitalist. He's a really smart guy, and I think a lot of his appeal to the Trump campaign was he can help access uh, Silicon Valley money. That changes now, right? I mean, I don't think the calculus changes on the Republican side. Republicans are going to vote for Republicans. Democrats can vote for Democrats. No one is going to vote against Trump because of J.D. Vance. I'm not sure that anybody's going to vote for Trump because of J.D. Vance. On the Democratic side, who knows? We're completely uncharted territory. Um, and if I, and you know, the favorite parlor game in D.C. now is who's going to be VP, and people are quietly running behind the scenes and all that. I think what Democrats are looking at are a couple of things. One, um, somebody who, who's been vetted within an inch of their lives already. No surprises. There's no time to do much research. Uh, the second is maybe somebody from a, a state that could, who could help in a state the Democrats need. 
Uh, the third, importantly, is somebody who's not going to cause problems for the Democrats. He's not going to create a vacancy that will be filled by a Republican. Um, and then finally, and I think really importantly, it's somebody with whom um, Harris feels comfortable, right? This is a shotgun arranged marriage for 100 days. These people are going to be spending a lot of high-pressure time together. And then if it works, they've got to work together for four years. So I think Governor Bashir of Kentucky is off the table because uh, he's a Democratic governor in a state that's pretty conservative, supports President Trump. You take Bashir out of Kentucky, you get a Republican governor. I think that puts Senator Kelly of, Cal- of Arizona near the top of the list. He's an astronaut, uh, retired astronaut, Navy, which means he's clean as a whistle. Um, Arizona is kind of in play for the Democrats. Of course, his, he's married to Gabby Giffords, who we talked about a few minutes ago. Another is Roy Cooper of North Carolina, Democratic governor. He's term limited out, so he can't run again. Um, and apparently he and the vice president know each other from when they were both attorneys general. And then the other one is, you know, kind of within sight of your, your broadcast studios up there in, in Pennsylvania, a popular Democratic governor, and Pennsylvania is an important state. So I think those are the three names people are talking about, Kelly in Arizona, Cooper in North Carolina, and Shapiro in Pennsylvania. Peter Loge is our guest here on the program. Maria Lawrence. Um, uh, uh, sh- switching gears, not really, but a little. Let me ask you, Pete, um, the call for civility that came hours, minutes, days after the assassination attempt, um, do you see that as something that is going to um, be maintained or um, is it going to, is it going to lessen personal attacks or um, will those start, continue, whatever your, um, whatever your thoughts might be on that? I, I, I tell you what, I, I hope, that we meet at this time. Um, this is something Bill Stubblefield devoted a lot of his energy, time, money to. Um, it's something I'm proud to be affiliated with up at Shepherd University. I run the Project on Ethics and Political Communication. There's National Institute for Civil Discourse. There's a lot of people talking about this. And I think in West Virginia, you're really lucky to have somebody like Bill so committed to it. Uh, I, I want to think it's going to stick, but we saw this after... Congressman Scalise was shot. We saw this after Representative Giffords was shot. Uh, we saw this, like we've seen this again and again, right? I, I felt like a college kid, you know, who promised on a Sunday afternoon promises to never drink again until next weekend. You know, don't don't tell me what you think when you're coming out of church on Sunday. Show me what you're doing coming out of a bar on a Friday. But I think that the way we we get to a better place is each of us has to be better. I'm trying to temper my metaphors, right? I'm not calling this a battle, for example. I'm calling this a debate because politics is a debate. It's not armed conflict. Um, I, I have very strong opinions about about the presidential candidates. I'm trying to put those in terms of, of policy and not not personality. Um, I want to make, you know, I, and the other part is I think it's all, it's upon, it, it's incumbent on all of us to hold each other accountable. Right. So you had a lot of Republicans and a lot of Democrats coming out after President, the, the attempted assassination of former President Trump saying, dial back the rhetoric, dial back the rhetoric. The moment one of those people goes over the top again, and over the top doesn't mean partisan, over the top doesn't mean pointed, over the top means some people don't deserve to live. It means violence is sometimes called for, like really inciting violence. I want a reporter to call that person and say, hey, two weeks ago, You said calling for violence or extreme rhetoric was out of control. Here's what you just said. How do you explain yourself? Hold people accountable, right? We behave our incentives. I know I should floss my teeth more. The moment I floss is like a week before I go to the dentist. They're thinking, holy cats, I don't want to get yelled at by my dental hygienist again, right? (laughs) What we ought to do and what we actually do are different in many cases. And we end up doing those things we're rewarded for. Um, and, and we want to avoid punishment. So let's hold each other accountable. I think, I hope. I'm, I'm, uh, I don't know. I'm hopeful, but not optimistic, if that makes any sense. I want to point out that I'm a regular flosser. Uh, Me too. Peter. I want to make that distinction now. Bill, Dale, how about you? Are you nope, a flosser? I am not. I am not. Okay. <laughs> Always before bed. You know, it's like a second dinner, Maria. You can get some good food that way. It's, uh, we're two out of three here. Sure. Uh, Peter. I had, I had a dental, I had a dental hygienist tell me that, that I stored enough 
food in the gaps of my teeth that I was like a squirrel. It was. That's not a good sign. <laughs> no, it is not. But I tell you what, I've been paying a whole lot more attention ever since. Sure. Don't <laughs> don't eat popcorn before you go to your dental appointment. Peter. That's for sure. Exactly. Yeah. No or popcorn, peanuts. No peanuts is another bad one. Hey, anyway. I want to ask you about the, uh, the the personalities involved in a presumed Trump Harris. Uh, debate because uh, this morning on my drive in, I heard out of uh, DC radio that uh, President, uh, former President Trump, has agreed to one and maybe even two debates with uh, ha- with uh, Vice President Harris. So she's a former prosecutor, which means yep. her personality is a little bit different than the average politician. Uh, is she uniquely qualified as a pr- former prosecutor? to deal with the aggressiveness of former President Trump more so than uh, most typical politicians would be? Uh, I think, you know, I mean, a lot of politicians are former prosecutors, but I think in this case, yeah, certainly different than than President Biden. President Biden built a a long and distinguished career in Washington as a dealmaker, right? You sit down, you quietly figure it out, some jibes, some you're making fun of each other lightly, talk about your kids, cut a deal. Uh, That is not how Vice President Harris came up. She came up putting bad guys in jail. A lot of liberals didn't like her in, in 2020 because her nickname was Kamala the Cop. And there are two things that stand out for me. One is apparently in, in 2020, uh, her team was prepping her potentially to debate against Trump, right? In politics, you're always thinking sort of one campaign or one election ahead. And they, they looked at clips of Trump with uh, Clinton. And Trump was sort of stalking around behind Clinton, and Clinton sort of got got mad at him. Apparently, in the practice, Harris's response was, why are you being so weird? (laughs) (laughs) That was just brilliant. And then Harris is actually making this, uh, the fact that she's a prosecutor, a a core part of her some speech. That she put away people who were sexual predators and violated and uh, fraudsters and so on and so on. Um, I've dealt with people. I know people like Donald Trump. So she's kind of setting it up. Um, it'll be it'll be interesting, right? But as with most, one of the things that debates do debates don't tend to change a lot of minds, but they do tend to introduce candidates to voters. And it didn't. I mean, obviously the Biden Trump debate mattered a lot. But had had Biden not done so poorly, it wouldn't matter because we all know who Joe Biden is. We all know who Donald Trump is. A lot of voters don't know who Vice President Harris is. And so I think the debate will be an opportunity for her to introduce herself to a lot of the American people who did not watch the Democratic Convention or who want to learn more about her um, at, at versus the Donald Trump, who we all know really well from, from his time as president, from his time on television, and kind of just kind of being a personality in America. I, I think it would be a fascinating, um, it'd be a fascinating debate to watch. Peter Lodge, I want to thank you very much for your time this morning. Bill, did you want to say goodbye? <laughs> yeah. Peter, thanks for joining us today. Always insightful, and I really appreciate your views. I appreciate it much. Uh, huge thanks. It's always a pleasure to join you guys. And I look forward to tuning into this next guest. He sounds interesting and fascinating. <laughs> yeah. Glad I could warm up for him. And all the nice things you said about Bill means we're going to have to deal with the aftermath of that the next hour and a half, <laughs> Peter. Thank you so much. <laughs> it's great. That's great. great. Talk to you all soon. Okay, okay. Bye. Good seeing you, Peter. He really talked you up pretty good there, Bill. He did. He's a nice man. <laughs> a smart man. He's a smart man. I might point yeah, out that. like the smartest one you've ever met, you said. So there's that. I said he's a very smart man. I might, okay. I might point out that Bill booked that uh, appointment for us there. Yeah, so. I'm, uh, yeah.